Today, we are discussing Federal Realty Investment Trust, ticker FRT. Over the next few minutes, I'll discuss my thoughts on both valuation of this company and its business quality. First up, the market cap is $8.9 billion, enterprise value of $12.8 billion. So you can see about $3 billion in net debt on this business, making up about 25% of the overall enterprise value. That's a significant amount of debt, but it's not uncommon for a real estate investment trust, which this is otherwise known as a REIT. If we go to the business description, we can see that Federal Realty recognized leader in the ownership, operation, and redevelopment of high-quality retail-based properties located in major coastal markets, D.C., Boston, San Francisco, L.A. So long-term sustainable growth, investing in communities. Um, so it has urban mixed-use neighborhoods, environments. They have 106 properties, including 3,100 tenants, 3,200 residential units, um, Increased quarterly dividends for 54 consecutive years. That's actually pretty good. Longest record in the REIT industry. So good to know information there. Lots of things that you would really like. Signs of potentially a high quality business, especially this long-term dividend history. That's always a very good sign as you're considering investing into a business. The next thing I want to look at though is the return on invested capital. And the first thing we see, of course, is another good sign of a high quality business, which is 20 straight years of profits. When you see this line being above the 0% mark, you can see that they've been profitable every year since 2002. And that's not uncommon if you've had 54 consecutive years of dividends. Very good sign there as well. Now, the thing that I like as well is you see that this is relatively stable from year to year. I mean, if you just look in this 2012 time period, 4.39%, 4.42%, 4.11%, 4.8%, very low variation year to year tells you a lot about the business, it tells you about the predictability of the business, the reliability of cash flows. That's a very good sign as an investor because it makes it easier to predict the future. Now, it does look like they had some volatility due to COVID 2020, 2021, and they had their earnings drop during those years, but it looks like maybe they're coming back a little bit in 2021. If 2022 is back to a normal level, that would be a very good sign. It's not uncommon that you'd had some disruption during that timeline because of COVID, but you can see in general, they're hugging this 5% range for a turn on vested capital. That's not very high. So that is a downside. I'd really like this to be in the 10% range. That's where I like to target because I'm looking for 10 to 15% returns on my investment. So if I can get that without debt, that would be a 10% plus return on vested capital. But with that, you start looking at return on equity. And we do see return on equity of 11.8% over the last eight years, after the last 10 years. Now, ideally, this would be a 15% number with this 10% number of return on vested capital, but you're still getting very strong leveraged returns due to the use of debt in this business. So that is a good sign that they're leveraging it well. I would like this number to be a little bit higher, but overall it seems to be a high quality business with relatively low returns. Not uncommon real estate right now, but something to be aware of. Now, where you have a concern, though, is when you start looking at the valuation, you see a PE of 23. So the market seems to recognize the high quality nature of this business. But the problem is of paying a PE of 23 is you're starting to get something like a 4% return on your current earnings, which is a relatively low number to get double digit returns because you need growth of at least 6% in order to get a 10% return if you have only a 4% starting yield. 4% starting yield plus 5.6% revenue growth would indicate somewhere in the range of a 9% type um, return to shareholders. And again, if you're looking for those double digit returns like I am 10, 12, 15%, then something like this 9% starting range is a little low. You need a better starting valuation to really justify that. The other sign that's not very good here is you're growing your assets faster than your revenue, and that's going to cause some negative operating leverage. You see the EPS is growing slower than otherwise would be you see the EPS growing slower than your revenue, which is a sign of that negative operating leverage. You're not getting as good of business results on the EPS line as you would revenue. That could be due to dilution. It could be due to some of this growth in assets being faster than revenue. It could be to changes in interest rates. Many things could cause this. But if we look at this, this would be the more pessimistic way to look at the business. If you combine a 4% current valuation with a 3.6% growth, maybe you're talking about 7.5% returns by owning this business over the long term. And that's just a little too low 
low for me. So let's see if we can dive on a little bit more into some more numbers to see if that changes any bit, makes things look a little better. But so far, it's not the nicest potential return. It looks like a stable return, but you're talking about high single digits at this point. You see the EPS started out the decade at $2.35, into the decade at $3.26. So you see about 50% growth over the course of the decade. Again, that's pretty low. It, it does match up with the 3.6% growth, but I'd really like this to be in the 7% range, 10% range. That's a much better growth rate if you're going to hold a business over the long term. It also showing that, of course, you're capping your dividends per share and you're paying a significant amount of your money out in dividends. Now, part of the problem here is, I mean, look at the big difference is you're paying out more in dividends most years than you are in earnings. $2.84, $2.35, $3.00. 246, 230, 241. Now, this is not uncommon in real estate. You can use cash flow that exceeds your EPS because there's such a high depreciation rate that this is something you can pull off, but it's going to require constantly increasing your debt and constantly issuing new shares, which we're going to see in the income statement most likely to in order to pull that off. And I think that's something that's going to play out here. Now, what you'd like is to be able to grow at these rates without having the dilution, without having growing um, your debt. The only way you can do that is with really high returns on equity. And we're not seeing that here. Um, now we're next, we're going to go to the income statement. Please consider liking this video if you're enjoying it so far at the end, I'm going to ask you about subscribing, but I want to make sure I'm adding a lot of value to you first. So let's go into the income statement, balance sheet and cash flow statement. So you can learn a little bit more onto the income statement. We can see a few things. SGNA growing about 50% as well, 31 million to 54 million. That's a pretty good sign. You're growing it in line with your gross profit. There's a lot of, not a lot of negative or positive operating leverage there. Um, so that's not a big concern. What you do see is of course, this dilution that I talked about. You've gone from 64 million shares outstanding to 77 million shares outstanding. That's about a 20% dilution rate over the course of a decade, 2% per year reduction in your CAGR of the returns. So if we go back to here, where's that 2%? Well, it's right here. It's this difference, difference between revenue and EPS. You can see a 2% gap there. So revenue is growing at 5.6%. EPS only at 3.6%. That 2% gap is coming from the dilution. So shareholders are only getting a 7.5% return when they should be getting a 9.5% return if they didn't have to dilute in order to pull this off. So you, on the one hand, you say, okay, well, what if they just stopped the dilution today? That would be great. The big question though is, can they stop the dilution and still pay out the dividend? Can they stop the dilution and still grow? Probably not because of how the business is structured. Now, I would still encourage them to stop the dividend, but to change their other capital allocation to make it work. But that is what you're seeing here in the numbers that may not come out on the first level. So if we go to the balance sheet, we can. I really want to study their debt. And the debt is a big concern here as well. You've gone from $2 billion in debt to $4 billion in debt. So you've doubled your debt, but you didn't double your EPS. Again, we go back to our income statement here. You can see $2.35 per share. Well, I guess in the most recent 12 months, you are at the doubling range. But of course, in 2021, you're at 326. So let's, let's give them the benefit of doubt and say they did double. And then it's okay because we say, okay, well, you've doubled your debt. You've doubled your earnings. That matches up decently well. It also makes the numbers look a little bit better because now your EPS is going to be closer to a 7% growth if you actually doubled it over the course of a decade. But again, COVID is distorting the numbers a little bit. So this company could be a bit better than I've stated so far. If you really need to study, though, the difference between... Is the COVID performance something I can rely on or is the post-COVID performance something that I could rely on? Which one of those is more accurate to the underlying business? And that's going to make a big difference in the overall value proposition for you as a shareholder. Let's go to the cash flow statement, see what else we can see. Well, actually, I want to go to PP&E. So they're not showing at PP&E, but they're showing other assets. You can see that they've also doubled their other assets, which this would be your real estate value. Um, so everything's growing in line. That's good. You're not really seeing any sort of negative operating leverage on that number. You can see though, this consistent PP&E investment. And what I want to bring an alert to is this is coming for a lot of real estate companies is you're going to see that PP&E investment a lot of times exceeds cash flow from operations when you combine it with the cash paid for dividends. So if you add up PP&E, of 181 million, you add 178 million of dividends, it exceeds both net income and cash flow from operations. So not only is dividends of 178 million exceeding your earnings, the PP&E investment is also exceeding your earnings. So independently, they exceed your earnings, but you've doubled up 
you've more than two extra earnings into what you're putting out to both shareholders and reinvestment. It just doesn't work over the long term. It's not very sustainable. It's why you see this constant issuance of common stock. It's why you see this cost constant issuance of debt is because the way the business is being run is in an unsustainable manner. Can it happen for a long time? Yes, it's happened for a decade here. It could happen for another decade maybe. But eventually this breaks down because you can't do it forever. You're exceeding your cash flow from operations. You're exceeding your net income in 2012. Do you do it again in 2013? Yes, you do. Do you do it again in 2014? Yes, you do. Look, PP&E investment is higher than cash flow from operations in 2014 before you pay a single dollar in dividend and they paid $215 million in dividend. Look at how that's matching up well with the, with the issuance of common stock. This is kind of ponzi in nature where you're paying out to current shareholders by issuing shares to new shareholders and it just continues as a way to constantly dilute you over time where you kind of have this dividend yield, you're paying it out, but you're bringing in new money from issuing debt and issuing shares. You're not really paying it from your cash flow because the cash flow is not there. There's no free cash flow in this business because you're putting all that money back into buying new investments, new real estate. And it looks like every single year, PP&E plus dividends exceeds cash flow from operations. I don't see a single year where that's not true. And that's a major concern to me because it means that as an investor today, I know they have a 10 year history of investing unsustainably. And I don't want to be an investor in that in the future. So for that reason, I'm not going to be an investor in federal real estate investment trust. It won't go on my watch list, but I hope you have learned something new from this video. I hope it's helping you become a better investor. And if so, I think you would really enjoy subscribing to my channel. So hit that subscribe button now because I'm working through every company in the S&P 500. And if you want to see some companies that have really good metrics through this methodology, check out the click to the watch list at the top of the video. That'll get the watch list of S&P 500 companies that I really, really like. And if you want to use this software, quickfs.net. My affiliate link is the first link in the description below. I hope you'll check that out. Until next time, stop paying fees, start building wealth.